here we go with the last of the worm notes, our segmented worms, the annelids, things like earthworms and leeches you are familiar with. Um, Annelidia means little rings, and that describes those little body segments. They're the segmented worms. Round worms were unsegmented, flat worms were unsegmented. So our first characteristic is going to be segmented. They're segmented because they have septa, and the septa separate each segment, uh, their little internal walls. Uh, we also have something that sounds similar, the setae, but those are those little hair-like structures, the bristles uh, that attach to each segment. And if you've ever gone out and caught earthworms, and you grab one and it's partway down in its burrow. When you first grab it, it sticks all those setae out into the side walls of that burrow and it's hard to remove. If you pull too soon, uh, you'll break it. But if you wait just a moment, it tires and then you can slide the whole worm right out. Uh, they have a closed circulatory system. We did not have, um, you know, we had diffusion going on with our flatworms and our roundworms. So we have a closed circulatory system, uh, blood staying in the blood vessels. A uh, dorsal pharynx, you know, the pharynx is just sort of the, the throat area. Um, it's toward the, the uh, top of the animal. You'll see a diagram later. And a ventral nerve cord, that main um, nerve cord in their nervous system, runs on the underside of the animal. We are uh, looking at our first animals that have a true body cavity. They are coelomates. And then when we start taking a peek at um, the seven essential functions, Right? Again, always uh, with all of our worms, we have some that are parasitic. We have the vast majority are free living. Um, with our annelids, we have some filter feeders. Those are the ones that live in the ocean. And then uh, most of the other ones are some sort of predators or scavengers uh, eating whatever they can find. So things like our earthworm, um, they're just crawling through the soil, eating a bunch of stuff. Uh, it goes in, we will dissect an earthworm, you'll look at the esophagus and at the crop and at the gizzard and all that. Most of the length of the worm is the intestine. Um, and it just digests out whatever um, is in there that's edible and passes the rest all the way through its excretory system. So again, a complete digestive tract with a mouth at one end and an anus on the other. Uh, let's see here, for respiration, I mentioned already, um, the aquatic ones use gills. The, the uh, terrestrial ones, we're still relying on diffusion across the moist, thin membrane, which is the skin. Um, one of the reasons why worms have to stay wet is so that they can breathe. When you uh, walk around after a rain and you find them uh, dried out on the sidewalk or the driveway or somewhere, they came out of the ground probably because their burrows were filling with water and they couldn't breathe under the water, in the water. So they got out on the surface, and then once they get out on the surface, uh, the rain stops, and they don't end up back in their burrows yet, and the sun dries them out, and you no longer have a thin, moist membrane for exchanging gas. Now you dry it out, and the worm suffocates. Uh, the excretory system, um, one-way digestive tract, we mentioned that. Nephridia, um, filtering out waste from the blood. Um, it's the precursor, you know, we have nephrons and nephridia, um, precursor to a simple kidney. Nervous system, we finally have gotten enough of a concentration of nerves at one end of the body that they, your textbook starts to use the word brain. Um, earlier we had ganglia, which were little concentrations or little groups of nerves and things like that. But with our annelids, they're finally um, calling it a brain. So they have other uh, sensory structures, um, those real simple eyes for detecting light, um, chemoreceptors, different things like that. Movement, still the same as what we've been looking at all along, hydrostatic support, uh, muscular contraction, you can change the shape of your body and move yourself along. Reproduction um, is sexual reproduction. The earthworm, when I mentioned to you, if you are hunting them and you grab it and you pull too quick and you break it, it can regenerate the end of its body, but the end that you break off, that tail, is not going to regrow a new front end. So they don't have asexual reproduction, they just have regeneration. So it's sexual reproduction, um, external fertilization, um, lots of situations where we have separate sexes, there's a male and there's a female. Other times we have hermaphroditic um, organisms. The one you're most familiar with, uh, the night crawlers, are hermaphroditic. Um, and so uh, they uh, 
pass sperm back and forth um, to each other to fertilize eggs. Uh, let's see here. You're going to have three classes you need to know. So the first one is um, the oligochaete. And oligochaete apparently in Latin means few hairs. So those are the things like the earthworms and their relatives. They have relatively few setae. Um, reproduction we just talked about, opening on the ventral side, da, 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 hydrostatic support. Um, we'll count your worm segments, number of segments when you um, do your dissection. Or depending on how old they are, they'll have you know over 100. Some advantages of a segmented body, uh, locomotion each segment controlled separately so you can move better. Um, injury protection, I mentioned if you tear off part of that tail, you can regrow it. And then speciali specialization, um, that part on the night crawler that looks kind of like a Band-Aid um, specializes for reproduction. Second class, Herundinae, there are about 500 species of those, and those are your leeches. If you're familiar with those, they have a, a proboscis, which is just sort of a um, specialized mouth part on one end. Um, for attaching to their host and so they will um, administer an anesthetic so you don't feel them and an anti-clotting um, chemical so that your blood doesn't clot and so they can just easily feed and ideally for that leech it would attach to you it would feed completely and then it would just fall off and you would never even know it was there um, and if you think about when you found leeches attached to you know your foot or your ankle or something like that, you probably didn't feel them. You probably noticed them. You saw them once you got out of the water. The third class are the polychaetes, and the opposite of oligochaete with, with few hair is polychaete many hairs, and those are the ones that um, are more living in the ocean in the marine areas. Um, they're the ones that are filter feeders oftentimes, and uh, I am not too familiar with with very many polychaetes at all. Uh, as far as ecology of the earthworm goes, we know that even though they are an invasive species, they uh, traveled across the ocean um, in plants and soil and things like that, that uh, they do a lot of good as far as um, tunnels for plants and water and uh, churning up the soil and processing, you know, uh, decaying stuff that's in the soil and all that sort of good stuff. A um, couple of diagrams for you here showing those three classes. There you go with a lugworm and a and a clam worm. Like I said, uh, class polychaeta, not real familiar with those. A legachete, that's your, your earthworm, your nightcrawler kind of a thing, and then Herundine, your leech. We'll tell you stories in class about leeches, um, using them for medical purposes, uh, draining blood. Say there's a, a surgery where you have to reattach um, a uh, finger or something. Well, one of the things that causes that surgery not to go so well, not to be successful, is all of the swelling and the circulation can't happen. So if they put leeches in the area and they keep drawing off those fluids, um, it keeps the swelling down and you can actually have a little better chance of um, success on your surgery. The diagram here that we're looking at now uh, we'll obviously go over in class. You can try and label as many parts as you can on your own. Um, you've, you know enough about your animal parts so far, what we've been talking about. You'll do pretty well on this. Um, number five and number four there, I'll give you a little hint. Number four is going to be the crop. That's going to be for holding and softening the food. And number five is going to be the gizzard, and so those little lines um, are, are uh, indicating it's a little more muscular and firmer because the gizzard is grinding, and so it's just a muscle that, an area that keeps expanding and contracting, expanding and contracting, and it kind of kind of helps the worm chew up the food, if you will. And the last thing I've got for you to take a peek at, uh, let's see here. Our comparison on the cross-section of the three types of worms. Well, when I said last thing, next to last thing. So you can see kind of the shape of the flatworms and their bodies and why they're considered flat. And then we got the roundworms with their pseudocilum partially um, lined um, body cavity and all that kind of stuff, false body cavity. And then we have our annelids, which are the true body cavities, uh, a psyllum. 
same cross section that's what they would look at look like now an assignment that I have for you is to do a comparison now that we've looked at all three of these kinds of worms make yourself a chart something like this that has all three uh, worms mentioned flatworms roundworms and segment worms and then over in this side tell me their different phylum names what kind of body cavity they have whether they're segmented or not parasitic members or not free living or not how they digest food what they eat right circulation respiration all the seven essential functions and all that kind of stuff and then uh, I gave you some uh, examples here of specialized features that they have feel free to add more to that and when you get done filling in that chart and adding to it email it to me at r s t o w e r s at lake orion dot k12 dot m i dot u s thank you